All right. Um, when I uh, started to do my presentation slides, I realized that I had made a huge mistake. My, my title is very, very long, and uh, having a, a presentation that has a very long title between you and the lunch break can be really devastating. But I, I will do my best. Uh, I have also a lot of uh, images. I try to show you some images as well. Uh, so uh, try to bear with me. Uh, OK, so uh, we will continue actually talking about, uh, uh, in addition to temporal layers of, of uh, images, also image similarity which is quite interesting to, to see here. So um, in a, a couple of past years, I have been working with uh, uh, audiovisual materials and with specific interest to long-term uh, span of audiovisual news production. And more precisely, um, I have been working with newsreels. Uh, newsreels were approximately 10 minute long films that were shown in cinemas before the actual feature in the 20th century. The production uh, was started in the 1910s, um, but uh, and in many countries uh, the production stopped in 1960s, but for instance in Soviet Union and in, in uh, state socialist countries, they were produced until 1990s. So I have a, a quite long time span uh, here. I'm not working alone. Uh, I would not be able to do this alone. Uh, so this is a work of highly multidisciplinary research team uh, with my collaborators at Tallinn University and, and at King's College as well. Um, so um, all together we have uh, two data sets. Uh, one of them uh, is a data set of Soviet newsreels, uh, basically 10,000 newsreels uh, produced from uh, 1930s until 1990s. Uh, and also we have a similar collection of Estonian newsreels as well. Uh, but in this particular uh, talk, I will be focusing on uh, newsreels produced in Moscow, in uh, the central, like we can, I can say, this is like a Pravda of, of newsreels. That was the central newsreel um, uh, series that was produced uh, starting from 1944 until uh, 1992. So uh, in our uh, research, we have been um, we have similar or, or different kinds of uh, research streams and, and 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 a chain of publications coming up. But one of the um, interesting topics that uh, and and that I will be now talking here more about is that one of the research questions that we have been having is to look at what kinds of temporal dimensions of visual discourses we can identify in, uh, in daily news, the Novastidnia uh, newsreel series. Um, and kind of like, what can we see there? What kinds of temporal uh, differences there are? And this leads to what I call my annotation problem. Um, so let me uh, explain you a little bit more. So at current stage, if we look at um, like uh, film uh, analysis or, or especially uh, analysis of uh, uh, images in film, they, there is a kind of like generic trend that, that uh, scholars focus on either manual or, or computational recognition and annotation of images. Um, and the results uh, of this annotation are usually lists of uh, textual keywords or numerical features. And then the analysis is done uh, based on sorting, clustering, and statistical analysis. Um, so, uh, but if, if I, I, I'm thinking about my research question in which I don't have any preset thoughts about uh, like specific, uh, specific uh, like objects I would like to recognize there or, or specific things, I just would like to kind of like topic model in a way, see the whole, what is there, and it, it, this is a large set of data, so um, I might be interested in something, but when watching all these newsreels, I might still miss something. So how to do this? Um, and uh, to this research question, I can see that there are certain shortcomings as well if I will take this annotation approach to my data. So I, I see these kind of like three intertwined uh, 
problems here uh, that are kind of like, I, uh, I have named them as uh, translation loss, partial view, and emphasis on deduction. So um, I will explain this a little bit more. So if we take, here is a toy set of uh, images that are not, that are quite similar, but there are, it, it's not very, they are not very different uh, from each other. Um, but if I start to annotate this, um, and for instance, if I, um, if I kind of like categorize them, for instance, by color, then uh, I will lose the information concerning the, the size uh, uh, and the, the position of these circles. So something is, um, is lost in translation here. And this leads to uh, my second problem, uh, which is partial view. Uh, if I'm annotating, for instance, blue and orange, uh, but then I will lose uh, the green one here. And this leads uh, to my third problem, uh, which is emphasis on deduction, uh, which means that, uh, for instance, if preceding literature says that orange is super important, and then I start to annotate all the oranges here, then, uh, and, and there is no literature about green or blue, but that's, that might be also very interesting and important finding uh, that we have just uh, forgot uh, something about the history. And, and so this is something that I, I'm kind of like trying to find ways to, to uh, overcome these problems. Uh, and of course, there are, uh, as we all know, uh, other uh, suggestions and, and uh, suggestions of alternative um, approaches. Um, Olesen and Massen, for instance, uh, have been using in interesting ways computer vision. There is, of course, we have a distant viewing framework that emphasizes on also at looking at the whole, uh, whole data set and, and uh, uh, viewing as an interpretive action. And then uh, Lev Manovich uh, is also uh, talking about how we should actually keep the numerical representation of images because digital, digitized images are in numerical form. And if we keep that, uh, we get to see uh, kind of like the gradual and continuous variation uh, uh, of, of the data instead of um, uh, readily putting the data into baskets of categories. That can be sometimes difficult because you, you, uh, you can, you, uh, sometimes you might need to put uh, one image into several baskets because there are you know, certain uh, features there. So our uh, approach uh, is to do what I call Preto annotation with machine learning first and kind of like postpone the human uh, labeling, which I of course uh, see that it's, it's super important, but I, I just want to postpone that phase. Um, so um, similar, so already yesterday we were uh, using a distant viewing toolkit where we did uh, uh, like uh, vector embeddings of the images. So this is kind of like basis uh, what we also do in our, um, in our approach. So we have done um, uh, around the ResNet 50. Uh, so we have uh, done this kind of like, we have turned the images uh, into multidimensional vectors based on the different ways the images are similar to each other. Uh, and after that, um, uh, we use uh, this uh, collection space navigator that I will talk to you a little bit uh, in a minute, uh, in which uh, we look at different kinds of uh, two-dimensional projections of these multi-dimensional uh, uh, images. Uh, and, and we are using uh, projections su such as uh, TSNI and, and UMAP uh, and so on. Just to illustrate you the different uh, projections, so um, so kind of like um, it is possible to see uh, to shift the view of kind of and look at the different ways the images are similar to each other. So in this way, uh, here we have, for instance, similarities based on color, or similarities based on the the, uh, the position and and the size of the circles. 
uh, again, of course, we are not the first ones to, to look at this, uh, and, and ResNet 50 has been used uh, also for Im historical image collections for, for several scholars also present here. Um, it has been used for querying similar images, uh, identifying uh, certain image uh, uh, groups, and recognition of temporal trends uh, and historical transitions uh, within images. So uh, how I see what are the implications of this approach to, to our research question is that uh, first we get to keep the numerical form instead of turning images into textual categories. We get to see how things have been uh, visualized instead of what. Um, and then um, there is a kind of like better recognition of subtle continuities uh, of similarities uh, and this kind of like uh, this allows to postpone the human interpretation towards the end of the um, the project, uh, and and I, I'm able to start the study inductively. Uh, so this opens possibility to uh, find new things, uh, un anticipated similarities, but of course there are sometimes also non-meaningful similarities for a human uh, viewer. So now I will talk a little bit about Collection Space Navigator, uh, which is an open source tool uh, developed by my colleagues at Tallinn University. Um, so here uh, is the website for this, uh, uh, this tool where you can find the code. There is a paper attached uh, and it's, uh, there is also a demo. So it, was, uh, it, it has been basically uh, um, designed for analyzing images, uh, and I have just been using it for, for uh, video data, uh, for, for uh, kind of like still frames um, of, of my videos. Um, our tool, of course, is not the first one. Uh, we have already been discussing Pixplot, but also colleagues uh, at, in Leipzig have recently published another, uh, another tool for, for doing this. So, so they, they should be also used, I think. But this is the view uh, to Collection Space Navigator. In the center, you can see uh, all the images, um, and then you can zoom in and out. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can switch between different projections. Uh, you can also add uh, kind of like some metadata that you, if you want, and, and kind of like use sliders for for narrowing down um, uh, based on the metadata. And on the left-hand side, you, you get to see <coughs> uh, specific uh, images if, um, when you are zooming in. I have this uh, on my, my uh, laptop as well. So if you want to play around with this, just com come to me and, and I will show it to you. Uh, but here is also another uh, online version um, so this is based on Estonian uh, newsreels or fractions of Estonian newsreel data. So uh, you can go into this website and, and explore this as well. So, um, so how we have been using this collection space navigator to study temporal dimensions of visual discourses in, in the Soviet newsreels, how the world was depicted by the Soviet newsreels to the Soviet audiences. So here is a kind of like the first um, image. So this is a Tisney uh, projection of the Soviet newsreels. And we can see that there are clusters of images with um, industrial production. There are clusters of images of uh, large crowds of people. But what is actually interesting to me are, are these kind of like, there is this uh, on the bottom, um, there are close-ups of individuals mostly men wearing black suits in meetings. And then uh, on the top, there are other types of close-ups of individuals, uh, but they are representing some, something else. For instance, uh, swimming children. And this is actually interesting finding to me that, um, that there is such a clear distinction. They are so different that they are also located in, in, in totally different ends of this map. Um, so if I would have been just looking at trying to identify uh, individuals, I might, might not have been able to see how kind of like, 
how there is this uh, clear distinction between different kinds of portrayals of, of individuals. Uh, and this is uh, also, it's possible to look at kind of like have this very distant view for the whole collection. So these are different um, Yuma projections. Um, thanks. Uh, so we have uh, on, on the horizontal axis, we have temporal yearly uh, baskets in a way. Uh, the baskets are not uh, kind of like equal. They are based on my uh, knowledge on, on Soviet history uh, and, and Soviet cultural history. And uh, uh, on the top uh, row, we have um, kind of like first uh, scenes of the newsreels. And then uh, in the center, there are these kind of like center scenes. And uh, in the bottom, we have the ending scenes. And this is based on on the kind of like the way the newsreels were arranged. Always at the beginning, they were talking about the important political meetings. In the center, there was always industrial production, agriculture, uh, scientific progress. And at the end, some more leisure, leisurely topics such as sports, uh, opera, mm, ballet, and so on. So this is kind of like way to, to see what kinds of types of images there are at different uh, temporal uh, positions. And uh, as we are looking at here, so we have certain types of meetings uh, uh, marked by A. Uh, C uh, is uh, agricultural production and D uh, is the leisure topics. And I will be talking about the um, strange bubble uh, in the late 1980s uh, at the end of my presentation. So just to get to you, give you some view, um, so here is, uh, I can, we can identify a very, uh, you know, continuity of very, very similar images of Soviet leaders standing on the Lenin mausoleum in, in, um, uh, in the Red Square, kind of like year after year after year, uh, repeating until the even late 1980s. Then we have clusters of uh, close-ups of people but within this cluster, we can identify subclusters of people wearing helmets or drivers uh, wearing caps in their in their cars. Uh, then there is kind of like interesting new way of presenting uh, Soviet leaders. These what I call like uh, dynamic leaders in movement, which we can see that it was uh, dominant uh, since the uh, mid 1950s until mid 1960s, and then it became a uh, less frequent topic. Uh, then we have a new types of um, meeting uh, meetings uh, appearing uh, in the late 1960s, which is also interesting because earlier the meetings were mostly uh, portrayed in a way that somebody is uh, standing on a podium and there is an audience like we have right right now here. But here, this is a more democratic, yes, uh, way of, of uh, kind of like having a negotiation actually. Um, then we have agriculture. Uh, and this is the, uh, what I call my uh, perestroika problem uh, bubble here. So this is kind of like, this bubble or peninsula appears only in the late 1980s. And although uh, Soviet newsreels um, applied color uh, in the same time approximately, this doesn't explain the whole, whole reason or, or uh, the whole situation why these particular images are uh, grouped here. So, and my hunch is that it could have been, could be something to do with the poses of people and their their gestures, because at this time uh, in the Soviet newsreels, they suddenly started to talk about economic, ecological problems, uh, political problems, and they were not posing anymore like this, but they were kind of like maybe, you know, discussing more about problems. And this is actually the point where I think that I should switch on to proper annotation and maybe using post detection or, or other types of things to kind of like dig deeper to understand this. I will uh, finish with this slide. Um, to me, uh, Collection Space Navigator um, 
in a, in a way helps me to postpone uh, human labeling. Um, I can explore both external and internal temporal dimensions of the newsreels. Um, and it, it is possible to identify informational hierarchies, uh, both clusters and subclusters, and temporal hierarchies, and differences in visual uh, similarities in news topics. Um, and I, I, I'm able to switch uh, between distant and, and close viewing. Thank you. Wonderful, and we have 10 minutes for questions. And the speakers keep on getting better. Um, not to shame Matteo. Um, first questions, come on. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Mila, it's <laughs> that's really fascinating work. Just curious about the annotator, when you bring in the human annotators, just, just out of curiosity, pragmatics, I mean, who, who would do that work? Do you have students who you would get to do that work, some of it, if it's really human labeling, or colleagues, or? Uh, yeah, so actually currently we are exploring with my colleagues, you know, you, you might think that I'm crazy, but I, I'm really interested in uh, depictions of Lenin. So uh, we, are, we are kind of like exploring how to use chat GPT to identify Lenin. So we have been testing this and uh, so that's one way that we are now uh, trying to do that. And I would also, um, uh, I think that uh, use computational tools to, for instance, to do post detection and these kinds of things. So, um, but I have been also indoctrinating myself by extensively watching these uh, newsreels, um, uh, which might I explain my interest to, to <laughs> Lenin. Uh, but, <laughs> um, and I, I totally, I totally think that there is. Um, we can't rely only on on kind of like computational things. So so, but there is this kind of like dialogue that we are trying to have here between uh, human viewing and, and uh, human uh, kind of like watching and, and reasoning, and then kind of like using the computational tools. And it's also I actually this is um, uh, interesting question because I think that sometimes. Um, uh, we can see some interesting patterns um, in the um, kind of like when we, so I, I kind of like think that when I'm using computational tools, I in a way use another set of glasses to, to look at the data, uh, which is uh, different than uh, when I'm looking at is a human, but there is always kind of like, it's a different kind of like view on that data, but, and maybe the truth is somewhere in between those views. Yeah. Another question? Yes, another. Okay, so um, you were mentioned different data sets from different countries, some uh, Estonian newsreel and some Russian newsreel. And I was wondering if there is a way using the collection space navigator uh, to actually see them together, see the revolution over time together, but distinguish which one is coming from one country and uh, which one is coming from the other without having to, to change topology, but in the same space. Yeah, yeah, I think this is an excellent question. We haven't done that yet, but that's something that I really would like to do next because um, I think it's, uh, especially now that we have this uh, Estonian newsreels made in uh, Estonia in Tallinn, but also Moscow made newsreels, and kind of like given the historical uh, dimension, we have data from uh, like 1930s when Estonia was an independent country, then we have from the Soviet occupation period, and then, so um, I think that that's exactly what are kind of like the next steps is to both of these col collections here together and to see um, kind of like what are the similarities there and if there are kind of like differences. Yeah, thanks. I know lunch is just around the corner, literally, but uh, do we have another question or comment? 
Maybe we should have lunch. Yes, maybe we will. So, you know, on, on, on that final note, well, I want to thank first, you know, Mia for our presentation again. So a few practical things. You are all invited to lunch uh, just outsta uh, outside. And um, during lunch, uh, there is a tour about an exhibition which is uh, at the library. Uh, just um, two minutes work. Uh, so it's about the graphic uh, archives of research from Jacques Bertin to Adrien Frutiger. It's a very nice exhibition and the curator is available uh, to give you a tour. So if you wish to do that, it will be possible today and tomorrow uh, at 1.20, 20, 25, something like that. So you can eat very, very fast and then could go to the exhibition and then go back here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so have a good lunch. <laughs> <laughs>